Good morning. I know that it, it feels uh, uh, disorienting to wake up in another place. I don't know if you guys have uh, woken up and felt that way. Like, where am I? I? I don't know if that happened maybe during the evening or during the day today, or um, there was some point in time when you, you just kind of like, wow, like for me, waking up this morning, I forgot where I was. <laughs> I just... I'm like, I woke up and I'm looking around going, oh, that's right. I'm at, in my church office. And uh, so it's it's good to be here. Um, this morning, uh, there, there's so many things that I, I believe that God wants to do in our hearts and how he, how he wants to comfort and speak to us. Um, I'm just really mindful of the fact that during this last week, um, with 70,000 people in Santa Cruz County displaced, uh, you think about what's going on all over California as well. So um, I know that some of you are, are in places where, you know, you don't know where you're going after this. Um, your your physical home isn't, isn't there, or maybe you don't know if it's there. And that anxiety and that stress of wondering um, may be heavy. But I also want to contrast that um, against the backdrop of seeing the beautiful people of God. The people that have provided breakfast and lunch and dinner, the people that have um, come to set up tents, our, our landlord, um, just other churches, uh, Covenant Community Church, uh, they said, hey, we have a bunch of vegetables and produce, so we sent a truck down, and that's like the vegetables and the fruits that we're eating, and then um, Mountain Bible Church, uh, John Haig came with just uh, a bunch of things, said, hey, here's some lunch, here's some things for you guys, and and then pallets of water from Westgate Church and other places as well. So the thing that really blows me away is the resilience and strength of you guys. Um, to see, you know, people that their homes, like you guys are, are in the same boat. And yet you're saying, hey, where can I jump in? You know, where can I help? Not just thinking of ourselves, but, but thinking of others. And I, I just want to encourage you as well with... Um, the anxiety and the sometimes the grieving that that's okay um it's god wants us to pour out our hearts and to be real with him and then there's this adrenaline that kind of will carry us through for a while and then there's going to be waves and spikes and, and times when things will get more difficult than others but i just want to pray and this morning um considering one kingdom indivisible it's the beautiful kingdom of god and so this morning, it's the beautiful people of the kingdom of God. So uh, would you pray with me? And, and if you're watching online, um, uh, realize that we're, it's hodgepodge. We're trying to, so we have a couple of Facebook cameras going and things like that. Um, because even, um, you know, people that are on our tech team, some of them are here. Some of them are displaced in other places. And some of you are evacuated out of our area, but maybe watching online. We just want to let you know we love you guys. Uh, we're glad that you're safe, and thank you for joining us. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for today. We ask that you would, um, in your grace, be with the firefighters today. Uh, we, we know right here in Santa Cruz County, we're about 8% contained today, but uh, we know that um, there are fires not only burning here, but in other places as well. And Lord, when we are in these places, I pray that it would build in us not only a faith and trust in you, but a compassion for others. Because Father, we've been on the other side of things where we've seen what has happened in the past in, in paradise or with the campfire and Lord, um, different places that have gone through what our community is facing. And so God, I pray that it would build in us um, a compassion when we see other people that are going through difficult things, that we would comfort others with the comfort that we receive in you. Today, Lord, as we gather, bless this time. And uh, we ask that your Holy Spirit would help us um, lift up our hearts towards you and help us to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in the beautiful kingdom of God, um, here's just a, a few pictures. The, the picture that was um, that's on the bottom right on that screen was the last shot that I took um, in evacuation from our place which is um, up off of the Whispering Pines. And um, the, the sky that day was just so orange. The sun was barely shining through the trees and, and the, it was a, a red dot. Some of you had already been displaced and evacuated from Bonnie Dune and from, from Boulder Creek. And so 
I had spent a couple of nights at the church here, but then that was the day when we went back to grab our things. And then coming here and just setting up uh, tents and then seeing um, just really families being together and not just families, but multiple generations. You see younger people and older people and, and uh, people that are just helping one another and feeding one another. You know, it really has been a blessing. Um, and, and then I think about this year and um, my, my brain's kind of scattered, you know, as I was preparing last night into the wee morning hours, just praying. And um, I just remember what happened when we, uh, in February, when the coronavirus started to come. And, and then um, right when we got to March and they said, okay, now it's uh, at a time where everybody's going to be sheltered in place. And it felt eerie. Do you remember that? Does that feel like forever ago? <laughs> Driving, I mean, the streets were empty. Everybody was in their homes. Schools were shut down. Businesses were shut down. And we looked at how Jesus is greater than the coronavirus, how even though it's a difficult thing that we go through, that we will not fear. Uh, I remember looking into history during that time and wondering, how did church, how did the church in history deal with pandemics? And so I found this quote from Martin Luther in um, 1527 dealing with one of the plagues that had um, invaded Europe he wrote I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order not to become contaminated and thus perchance inflict and pollute others and so cause their death as a result of my negligence if my neighbor needs me however I shall not avoid place or person but will go freely as stated above See, this is such a God-fearing faith because, because it is neither brash nor foolhardly hardy and does not tempt God. So reading in church history about how it was Christians that actually took people during times of plague. Uh, you had the Spanish flu and the bubonic plague, and it was actually Christians that took people into their homes. The amazing thing when you read about church history is that after the plagues, what happened is the people that stayed in the city were mostly the Christians that were caring for others. And then after the plague subsided, guess what? There was a revival of people coming to know the Lord in faith because it was the Christians that cared for them and that were there. And so I think about how God would have us consider things that yes, we should be cautious and yet at the same time, we're not to live in, in fear. So we went virtual overnight. I, this was our first Zoom meeting. <laughs> I think this was that Sunday, uh, our Sunday fellowship hall. And I remember when, um, now you might be Zoomed out and online meeting out now, you know, because it's the novelty has worn off. But on that first one, I remember the tears because we could see each other. And we, we had not seen each other for a while. Then we got this Zoom up and we saw faces and we began to share prayer requests. And we realized that we're in a community and we're not alone. And there was such a, an incredible sense of God's presence in that Zoom meeting. And then uh, the whole controversy about what is essential and what businesses can stay open and uh, essential businesses. And then the offense of people saying, well, we're essential also. Are you saying that just because, you know, I do this, I'm not essential? And, and uh, I, I just... That time was such a time for us realizing that the church is absolutely essential. We need one another. We need that community of the body of Christ. It's the place where, where we hear the truths of God, that there's no other place. And I'm not talking about Regeneration Church specific. I'm talking about the church globally that holds fast to God's word. And there's no other place where we hear those words of hope. No other places. It's like Peter said, to whom else can I go? You know, when Jesus said, are you also going to go away? There's, there's nowhere else. And we looked at the, the nature of the church being not just a building, but this supernatural group of people. It was after that, that um, George Floyd had gotten killed and uh, Breonna Taylor, there were other uh, people that had gotten killed and, and just kind of um, the issue of racism started to, to really rise up and in sensing that not only had things existed in the past, but it's still going on. And so Brandon Smith, who is a part of our congregation, um, was speaking there at Sky Park. And when you heard his voice, if you go back and you can listen to the archive, just you heard the voice of, 
a beautiful person that was just hurting and at the same time is saying, hey, um, we're not saying that any life is more important than other lives, but sometimes there's a group of people that are hurting that, that need uh, people to reach out to them and understand. And so, um, you know, as a black man, the things that he had gone through, he shared those things, being a resident here in Scotts Valley. And then um, right at that time, Officer Gus Weiler got killed. And then uh, there was just this intensity that was going on in our community. And, and I took this picture. Um, this is from the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office. Um, my daughter and I, we went there for that vigil and just saw so many people from the community. And it just felt like, man, th things are crazy and so many people were hurting. We addressed these things. We looked at the Word of God and we looked at how the closer that people of all races get to Christ and His cross, the closer they will get to one another. Because it's not just saying I'm a Christian culturally, because there's a cultural Christianity. This is to Christ and his cross. Jesus said, if anyone be, uh, desires to be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And when we deny ourselves, then we begin to see other people. And you know what I'm seeing during this crisis of these fires? The most joyful people, even though they're struggling, are the people that aren't just thinking of themselves. The most peaceful people, I mean, and, and it's okay, I'm not, there's no condemnation for anxiety and stress and times of breaking down. But what I see is that in the midst of this, we go to the Lord, we ask for his comfort, and then we begin to look around. And you see it's the people that are looking at others and helping others that, that the sense of joy can fill them even in difficult times not happiness it's different there's um, an analogy that I, I had read and I don't remember where it came from but um, it's a picture of, of hell being a bowl that is filled with soup and there are people that are sitting all around the rim of the bowl that are starving to death and they have these spoons where they could eat the soup but the spoons are too long, and so they, they actually can't feed themselves. And then there's an opposite picture. It's a picture of heaven, and it's still the same bowl of soup, still the same people sitting around the room, uh, the rim, still the same long spoons where they can't feed themselves, but everybody is feeding one another. And you know, it's, some, it's a picture. Now, obviously, that's uh, just a, an analogy, just a picture, but... I really think that when it comes to denying self and thinking about others, then we, we get our eyes on the Lord and he helps us to see the way that we can meet the needs of other people. And in doing so, there's an amazing healing thing that happens to us. But if I become very myopic and self-centered and only looking at my own needs and what I'm going through, um, and again, it's okay to, to just pour your heart out to the Lord when you're struggling in those ways. And I, I totally understand that. But there are times when someone else will be going through something that you're going through. And now God says, now here's a person that you could bring comfort to. And sometimes it's just being together. Sometimes it's not necessarily words like, oh, uh, and by the way, it doesn't comfort when we say, I used to struggle with that, but this is what I did. You know, like <laughs> I used to not have patience, but you know, God did a work in my life. No, it's just sometimes being with people. Sometimes it's hugging them. Sometimes it's just listening. Um, we went from there into the controversy of COVID-19 and the Christian of like, is this a thing? Is it not a thing? Uh, wearing masks, not wearing masks and all of these uh, ways that people will understand it. The businesses that are shut down and it's frustrating. I, I have, and I was just on a conference call with a bunch of other pastors this last week and one pastor said it really well, my friend Paul. He said, I have opinions. I have a lot of them. I hold them very deeply and I don't share all of them. Because if I shared all of them, it would immediately separate me from other people at times. So I'm very careful, he said, some of the things that I share and don't share. The reason is because as a Christian, if I'm going to reach people, if I'm going to talk about things or post things, I don't have that much bandwidth. I have enough trouble with the bandwidth for my own family. And then ministering to the body of Christ, I'm not gonna put out every fire. So if I have limited bandwidth as a human being, I want every 
fiber of my being to talk about Jesus. I want my heart, my, my conversations, I, I want it to be towards the things that are most important, things that are eternal. So then we went into the Psalms, and the Psalms were pouring out our hearts to the Lord. Remember, we, we put up the graphic uh, from the Lego movie, Everything is Awesome. I don't know if you've ever seen the Lego movie, but there's a song, Everything is Awesome. And we talked about that's not the Psalms. Because when you read the Psalms, there are times when everything is not awesome. And there are times when the psalmist will just share heart of anger and lament and sometimes imprecatory psalms because of enemies. And that means that we could just pour out our hearts to God. We could be real with God. He, In fact, he wants us to be real with him because he already knows what's there. We could be fake with other people, but we can't be fake with God because God just sees right through the heart. And we could just bear our heart and soul to him. And he understands. God speaks the language of the heart even when we can't get it into words. And then we come into this time and this season where um, a group of pastors had been praying. We met together thinking about this year, and this is, the, the pastors that started this actually started thinking about this at the um, middle of 2019, so a year ago. And then they got to 2020 and uh, Paul Taylor up at Peninsula Bible Church um, had a vision with some other pastors to get together and say, what if we studied about the kingdom of God together? And we did a series during the summer because our nation is, and this is in, again, January. Our nation feels divided. And what if we could focus on what we have in common in Christ as the most important thing? And so we decided to do that. And in the midst of those things, this fire hits. We looked at last week, I couldn't think of a better message. Uh, we, we looked at the church, the ecclesia, which is the, the people of God. And that's the picture on the bottom of people. And that one figure going against the grain, walking in a different direction versus the top of the picture being brick and mortar. And um, Barbara Burke was explaining to me, you know, I was, I was using the German word curtsy as a church. And she's like, it's curtsy. And I was like, what is it? So, it's so that's, she's pronouncing it correctly. I, I'm not. Um, what had happened was in, in German, the word for building cathedral, that word became the English word for church. So we now associate church with a building. But as you know, and as you see that the church is not the building, the church is the people. In fact, here's a picture that was taken um, yesterday or the day before, the day before yesterday. This is the Bonnie Doon Church. These are firefighters that are gathered uh, right outside there, outside of the Bonnie Doon Church. I think you might have to do that slide manually because this one kind of got stuck for a second. So these firefighters that are outside of the Bonnie Doon Church, is, it's a great picture of not only resilience, but of people praying. Um, that church right now is still standing. Uh, John Burke, actually, uh, it was the pastor of that church for 30 years. And so, so many of people in his, his congregation have been displaced and, um, you know, the heart goes out to them. But uh, as of yesterday, the church was still standing. So uh, praise God for that. Uh, we also, you know, then, then we moved into here and, and, you know, things have been going on like that. When I consider in the book of Acts, it says in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Now, the disciples in Acts chapter 2 were people from different regions, from Pontus and Cappadocia and from uh, Phrygia and Pamphylia, and they, they came together in this place. The Holy Spirit fell upon them. And remember, Jesus told them to wait for the promise of the Father uh, from on high, which was the power of the Holy Spirit that was going to come upon them. And I want to ask you a question. What was the visible representation of the Holy Spirit? It was fire. Okay, it was fire sitting on each person. Now, when I consider that, fire can be destructive, but fire can also be powerful and purifying as well. It's something when we looked at um, the the logo for our, our church. It's actually um, it's actually right there. It's a it's a flame, 
And in the midst of the flame, there's a, a cross because that fire is representative, uh, representative of the Holy Spirit. So I'm having some slide change error here. So maybe, Kenny, if you could go back to the picture of Essential Church, that would be um, slide number seven. There we go. So when we consider um, that picture, that logo of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, when um, he appeared to them sitting on top of each one, it was different than the fire of the temple. The fire of the temple in the Old Testament represented the presence of God for the nation of Israel. And they, they built the temple and then they built the tabernacle before that. Interestingly enough, what is the tabernacle also called? It's called the tent of meeting. It was a tent. So we have tents. <laughs> it's the tent of meeting. You can meet God in your tent. Um, but the Holy Spirit appeared with fire upon each one to show us that now the Holy Spirit, the presence of God is not relegated to a place. But now in the New Testament, the New Covenant, remember in 1 Corinthians that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit dwells in us. You and I bring the presence of God where we go. And that's an amazing thing to see in, um, you know, people again being displaced. I, I just got a text uh, this morning from uh, Kim Johnson and uh, they're staying at a hotel and, and when they walk into the hotel, they're seeing the different faces of the people and they know that's someone that's been displaced. And yet in that place, there have, there's so much light. There's people that are sharing hope. There's people that are praying for others that are, um, you know, just being there uh, compassionate for one another. So it says in Acts 2.42 that they were continually devoting themselves to uh, the apostles' teaching. And so the word of God, the word of God is so powerful. I want to encourage each one of us to get into the word of God for ourselves, to just open it up, to read. Um, it was Augustine that um, was really far from God. If you read uh, the confessions of St. Augustine in his background, and it was this voice in his head that saw a Bible and he heard a voice in his head, in his heart, really the Lord saying, pick up and read. Pick up and, can you imagine walking by a Bible and you hear this voice, pick up and read. And when he picked it up and he began to read the word of God, it was the word of God that began to change him and began to point him back to the Lord. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Koinonia was a word for fellowship that was actually invented to describe the kind of relationship that Christians have, which was different than the relationships that other people had. It was such a tight-knit um, doing for others and helping others that this word was used, and we call it fellowship, and it's from the word koinonia. Uh, they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And the breaking of bread is not just communion. It's not just the Lord's Supper, but it is also um, sharing meals. It's eating together. It's noticing one another. Eye contact. So while we are, you know, uh, following the, the rules for health, um, just in the COVID-19 rules, this is my microphone, it's getting caught here, but sometimes your eyes are the only thing that people are gonna see. And, and our eyes tell a story. It means that you notice someone. It means that I see you and you're here. And I, I totally understand at times when we're downtrodden. There's a, there's a reason why downtrodden is that word, because we're cast downward. And yet Jesus said, during times of tribulation and trial, when you see these things beginning to take place, what did he say? He said, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. It reminds us to look up, to lift our eyes, and sometimes we're overwhelmed, but our eyes just seeing someone and catching that eye contact, even if it's online, you know, even if it's just a FaceTime, um, we, we see that and that's that fellowship, the breaking of bread, eating together and prayer. Um, John Burke has, has said, hey, I'll still come, you know, 930 every day. We're here for prayer. If you would like prayer, um, if you're able, well, we're 
you can't get through. Sorry, you guys on the outside here, you're, you're roadblocked. But if you're here, you could you could pray with us at 9:30. But wherever you are, just to pray, to pray, God, please, um, may you be gracious to us. May we turn our hearts towards you. And it says everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. They they had a sense of God's presence, an expectation of God to work. And all those who believed were together and had all things in common. Together and had all things in common. That was not mandated by the Roman government. It wasn't mandated by any person. It was just what God was doing in their hearts. So the result of the gospel is a new community. It's they continued steadfast in devotion to Jesus. It's that there was a, a sense of awe. Um, and wonder looking at the things of God they were together had all things in common and they had gratitude and not simplicity it's simplicity <laughs> they said they had simplicity uh, there was really in the middle of simplicity what's most important now there um, definitely is a sense of being displaced if you don't have a home and yet just being together. I remember during the Paradise Fires, the um, you know out in that area, the campfire. I saw a picture that man, it really uh, it really epitomized this resilience and faith. It was a family, and they were standing, and behind them were ashes, and they were together, and they had their arms around one another, and the youngest child was holding a sign, and it said, "This place is not our home." And the reminder, um, yes, we need, we'll rebuild and, and we need homes and, and the Lord will help us and we're going to help one another. And, and yet at the same time, that simplicity is really simplifying things to say what's most important. And, and you've had that very practical thing of what some of you have not had the opportunity to grab things. And I, I'm just so sorry because that is just incredibly difficult. But when they say prepare a go bag, and maybe just one bag, you start to think what's important. I, I remember when Deanna and I were living in Gilroy, I actually had a dream um, that our house had burned down. And in my dream, we were standing, and my wife and I were here, and our kids were here. And I remember in my dream saying, it's okay. You know, it's okay, we're, we're here, we're together. and. That simplicity in considering the most important things and and um, really uh, there was a gladness um, and I see that I see the gladness in people's hearts of of just the gladness of being together and knowing that God loves them and what God has called us to be is a city on a hill Jesus talked about us being a city on a hill that cannot be hidden um, a city on a hill is a, a refuge a, a city on a hill is in a way, it's almost like a, an evacuation center or a shelter. Could we go to slide 20 on there? There we go. When we consider a city on a hill, um, our mission for Regeneration Church, our mission statement, Regeneration Church exists to cultivate a community of disciples who respond to the gospel by growing in relationship with Jesus and intervening for him. And you know, that's what we see. The intervention on, on behalf of Christ, however we could help, it's realizing that we are a community and that community doesn't just happen. It has to be cultivated. I'm a terrible gardener. Um, if you give me a plant, I can make it brown real fast. Like I have a gift for that. Um, but the people that are good at it, they cultivate their plants. They cultivate uh, their tomatoes, their blueberries, their whatever it might be. They, they know how to turn the soil and water it. And, and, and community doesn't just happen. It happens as we intentionally um, become real with each other. It happens as we show one another love, as we bear with one another, as we comfort others with the comfort that we've received. And then it's disciples. So we are growing as disciples of Christ. We're following him. We're responding to the gospel, not a sense of rules, but we want to live in a way because we see how Jesus is. And then we grow in relationship with him and, 
and then we intervene on his behalf. Jesus, where can I be your hands and feet? How can you use me? So as I close One Kingdom Indivisible, I want to close this message today. This is uh, part four of our series with a blessing. For those of you that are here and for those of you that are listening online, God wanted his people when they gathered together to hear this blessing. It was uh, a blessing that God gave to Aaron and Aaron was the high priest. And a priest is a go-between between between God and between people. So whenever people gathered, Israel gathered, and by the way, Israel, um, God, um, uh, governed by God, really, when you consider that word. So we're govern, if we're in the government of the kingdom of God, we, we want to follow the Lord. There's a blessing that he wanted his people to know. And Aaron, the high priest, was only a shadow of the high priest to come. When we read in the book of Hebrews, it says, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all areas tempted as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain grace, uh, help and grace, grace to help in time of need. We have a time of need and we have a high priest, Jesus, who can sympathize with our weaknesses. He can sympathize with our struggles. He knows what it's like to be homeless and displaced. He knows what it's like at times to feel like everything is against him. And yet in the middle of it, here's the blessing that God wants his people to hear when they gather together. The Lord spoke to Moses in number 6, 22, saying, Speak to Aaron and his son, saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, so there's words, The Lord bless you and keep you. And then whenever you see the capitals, L-O-R-D, it's not just God generic. This is Yahweh God. He is looking and he wants us to know that the Lord bless you and keep you. He's the one that's going to take care of you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Make his face to shine upon you. This is the look of a loving father to his children. May, may he, his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. God is so gracious. And then in verse 26, the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. It means he notices you. Remember we were talking about eye contact. That's how we notice people. We, we see them. We say, I, I see you. I notice you. When God lifts up his countenance upon us, it's saying, I see you. I notice you. I know what you're going through. And then it says, and give you peace. The word there is the word shalom, which is so much deeper in meaning than the word peace that we have in English. You know, peace in English is more absence of conflict, but shalom means health and wellness and a good state of being in right relationship with God and with others and in community and in God's creation. This is this place when we look at our world and we wonder why, why do things like this happen? I, I don't know, but I do know that God from the beginning had a plan but we live in a broken world. We live in a fallen world. And in this fallen world, there are things that happen that are hard and difficult. And yet in the midst of it, God says, I want to give you my peace. Jesus says, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. It's a peace that the world cannot give. It's a peace the world cannot understand. And then the last part of the blessing, it says in verse 27, so they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. God's name upon us. When God's name is upon us and he blesses us, he doesn't bless us to, to bless us and then, you know, build a moat around our, our home and put alligators in it and then an electric fence and get some guns and dig a well in the middle and say, I have all my supply, I have everything that I need in my little castle and nobody comes near. God blesses us so that the draw gate goes down and we say, come in and you could be blessed and, and we could share. That's, that's the heart of God. He blessed Israel so that they could be a blessing. When they didn't and they weren't willing to do that, 
then God said, okay, it's going to go to Gentiles as well. And Gentiles, that's those that weren't a part of Israel. That's most of us. God blesses us not only because he wants to show us his love, but then he wants to use us to bless others. That's the plan of the beautiful kingdom of God and the beautiful people in the kingdom of God. So let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Lord, thank you for your goodness. We, we just declare that you are good. And Lord, circumstances are not always good and, and um, difficulties like these fires are not always good, but, but Lord, you are good. And I pray that in the midst of it, that um, we would see our community be healed and come together. We, I pray, Lord, that you would use this to cause our hearts to turn to you, not only for the peace that you provide, but that we could be a blessing to others as well. Lord, thank you for taking care of us. Um, Lord, when I hear the, the sound of kids running around and laughing, it's such a blessing. Lord, to, to have dogs and uh, pets that give so much um, joy to people. It's, it's an amazing thing. God, we, we want to thank you for preserving life. We pray that you would continue to preserve life during uh, the fighting of these fires. And, and Lord, we... We pray again uh, for your hand upon um, just the firefighters, your hand upon this situation. And Lord, we also pray for those that are watching online, whether they're inside of our area or out of our area. Lord, that you would reach out to them, that you would remind each one of us that you want to lift up our faces towards you. And that, Lord, your countenance would shine upon us. You'd give us peace, that you are a blessing and a good God. So we thank you. Help us to follow you. Help us to follow your ways. In Jesus' name, amen.